So uh, while we're waiting, uh, I've done this at the start of every session. If you're making sure you're on the right at the right Zoom, you're at the uh, New York University online conference, where do we go from here? Revisiting Black Irish relations and responding to a transnational moment. I'm Dr. Miriam Nighton Gray from the Center for um, the Study of Ireland and the Irish Diaspora. I'm co-convening the conference with my colleague uh, Kim DaCosta from the Gallatin School of Individualized Study. Um, and Kim uh, will be presenting uh, in today's session. Uh, and as I continue to um, get people back on the line here with us, um, I have great pleasure in um, handing over for moderating duties for this um, session, Professor Liam Kennedy, who is based at uh, University College Dublin. Liam is Professor of American Studies and Director of the Clinton Institute at University College Dublin. His research in interests include American cultural and media studies, political communications, and Ireland-US relations. Recent book publications include Neoliberalism and American Literature, published in 2019, Trump's America in 2020, and the Routledge International Handbook of Diaspora Diplomacy, coming out in 2022. Congratulations, Liam, I didn't know about that one. He is currently researching a book on the future of Irish America. Liam is co-founder and editor of America Unfiltered, a media platform focused on contemporary American politics, foreign policy, and media. Um, it gives me great pleasure, Liam, to hand over the virtual mic to you and thank you for participating in this conference today with us. Thanks, Miriam. Um, hello from a rather wintry Ireland this evening. Um, congratulations. Congratulations to you and to Kim in designing and delivering a wonderful event. And I know there's more to come. Um, congratulations too in helping to open a space for much needed conversations about the interconnections between Black and Irish histories and identities in the US and beyond. Uh, I think it's timely, it's much needed work, um, and I think that the approach you've taken is very much the right one, a conjunctural approach, uh, taking in both the longer term histories of these interactions and also mapping their currency today. No better scholar to illuminate that conjuncture than Professor Kimberly DaCosta, who will speak to us now on how the Irish became Black, origin stories, genealogies, and a usable past. Professor Kimberly McLean DaCosta is a sociologist interested in racial inequality, and in particular, the contemporary production of racial boundaries. Her book, Making Multiracials, State, Family, and Market in the Redrawing of the Color Line, explores the cultural and social underpinnings of the movement to create multiracial collective identity in the US. Professor DaCosta is currently writing on interracial extended families and what they can and cannot tell us about interracial solidarity, care, and politics. Kim teaches courses on race in different societies, consumerism, and the commercialization of intimate life at NYU's Gallatin School. She's also been involved in the NYU's prison education program since its inception in 2013, most recently as its faculty director. Over to you, Kim. Thank you so much, Liam. Um, you know, it hardly seems possible that it's only been a year since I first participated in Ireland House's Black, Brown, and Green series. Um, in my contribution then, I recounted the ways that social media, the trending, uh, to use the parlance of our age, of Black Irish people had caught my attention with no small amount of delight and indeed surprise. Though I had followed the hashtag Black Irish for some time as a sort of curiosity, the thread mostly depicted the Black Irish of black hair and blue eyes, with the occasional post by a mixed race Irish Black person. In the wake of George Floyd's murder in the spring of 2020, a different hashtag, Black and Irish, emerged, one that centered the dialogue on what it means to be Irish and Black, be it by way of birth, passport, immigration, ancestry, or culture in Ireland now. A generation of rising immigration drawn by a blooming Celtic tiger economy had transformed an immigrant society into an immigrant one from which emerged another kind of black Irish population. One that was asserting its Irishness, their belonging and right to belong to the country of their birth, upbringing or recent immigration. As a Boston born woman with a black American father and Irish American mother, 
Raised in the 70s and 80s, I had not seen this before. Besides my five siblings, I knew of no other Black Irish people growing up. At that time, interracial marriage was stigmatized and rare in the US. So-called mixed race people were not counted as such and public expressions of such an identity were few and far between. See if this works, I'm sharing my screen. Um, yay. Um, when I came of age, yeah. When I came of age and learned of other Black Irish people, they were never inevitably celebrities like Mariah Carey or New York Yankees Derek Jeter. That their Black Irishness made visible through technologies of commodification and brand making rather than as members of some organic Black Irish community. Our similar ancestries seem like a nice fun fact, but not the most relevant thing we shared. Our uh, we, what made their stories interesting to me was how they navigated the peculiar, peculiarly tenacious stigma of Black-white mixing, born out of a deep-seated anti-Blackness. In a similar way, the stories told on Black and Irish, and in spaces like I Am Irish in the UK, across generation, nation, migration, and ancestry, sounded very much like mine. And while sociologically different phenomena in many respects, they are related, arising from a racialized understanding of Irishness as synonymous with whiteness, perhaps not always acknowledged as such in Ireland, but largely taken for granted in the US. The title of my talk, sorry, How the Irish Became Black, riffs on Noel Ignatius, How the Irish Became White, an influential historical account that Kevin mentioned earlier today of how Irish Catholics came to be considered white in the American system of domination. A thesis that of course presumes that they were once something else. Much of that discourse dwells, dwells on the comparison to blacks. Prior to becoming white, the argument goes, many native born Americans viewed these largely poor and unskilled immigrants as little different than black slaves. References to, with, with references to Irish Catholics as white Negroes and blacks as smoked Irish, symbolizing their shared low status position. In fact, there's a considerable literature that compares or an analogizes the Irish with African Americans, comparing their relative positions at the bottom of the social and economic hierarchy in 19th century America, the simianization of the Irish in 19th century propaganda, invoking a common trope used to dehumanize black people, the oppression of Irish Catholics by the British and that of American blacks by the US state, the mutual influence on their dance, music and literature, and the debates over the validity of the comparisons, this comparison fill many books, which Kevin so expertly described earlier today. And I encourage you to read them. They are not, however, the territory that my talk seeks to cover. Rather, I want to explore what the equation of Irishness with whiteness elides, elisions that it depends upon for its coherence and which are inseparable from notions of blackness. At the same time, I'm interested in what an investigation of how the Irish became black might offer for thinking about the possibilities and pitfalls of new projects that center on the black Irish here and abroad. To do this, I situate my remarks in relation to genealogy as a logic and practice that links together ideas about who we are as members of families with what we are ethnically or racially. We often learn what ethnic or racial groups we belong to and what that means through the stories family members tell us. More fundamentally, we imagine family relatedness and ethno-racial relatedness in the same way as characteristics acquired through birth and therefore natural. And we symbolize them both in the language of blood. In Western societies, ethnicity is kinship writ large. Our genealogical imagination, however, goes beyond analogy. The genealogies we use to record, narrate, recall, and recount family relationships are the same ones we use to establish our belonging in ethnic groups. And use them, we do. Genealogical research is said to be the second most popular hobby among Americans. Gardening is the first. 
sparked in significant part by the enormously popular television broadcast of Alex Haley's roots in the late 70s, a story of his African ancestors before the Middle Passage through slavery and after. Interest in genealogical research took off and proved to be especially popular with Irish Americans and African Americans. Diasporic groups for whom migration, either by slave ship or coffin ship, figures centrally in their history and collective understanding. This interest has only increased with the advent of commercial DNA testing services like Ancestry.com and programs like Henry Louis Gates' Finding Your Roots. Fundamentally, genealogies are or origin stories, tales we tell ourselves and each other about who we are and where we come from, who are our kin and who are our people. In this sense, they are texts that can be read for what they say about how we as individuals came to be and how, also how we came to be raced, white or black, Irish or not. By way of illustration, let me tell you a story. Okay. I was born in Boston, the fourth of my parents' six kids and raised in one of its suburbs. My mother, Mary, descends from 19th century immigrants. Andrew and Bridget Gorman left counties Clare and Galway and landed in upstate New York. Bridget Rafferty left Ireland, Sligo, I'm told, in the late 1850s, and by way of Nova Scotia, eventually landed in Providence. My great-grandparents, John, John Gorman and Mary Ellen Murphy, whose wedding photo you just saw, would have eight children, including my grandmother, May, pictured here in the back row. May would, would marry Arthur Rafferty, Bridget's grandson, and their daughter would, somewhat improbably in 1955, meet this guy when she was a camp counselor and he was a lifeguard. More improbably still, they would marry in Boston in 1962 and have us. Where I grew up south of Boston was then, and still is, one of the most heavily Irish regions in the country. The south shore of Massachusetts is sometimes referred to as the Irish Riviera and boasts the US most Irish city, situate, though Butte Montanans seem to disagree. Irish presence showed itself in the names of sports teams, elected officials, and neighborhood mailboxes. On our street alone, the McLean, we McLeans lived next door to the Druins, across from the VCs, McLaughlins, Higgins, and Sweeney's, and down the street from the Bulgers, Fiddlers, Melvins, and I could go on. We either made our first communions at Immaculate Conception or Our Lady of the Rosary, abstained from meat, eat, meat eating on Fridays, and were occasionally treated to soda bread, corned beef, and cabbage. Clatter rings were the rage among the preteen girls. It was Irishness, suburban American style, observable in ancestry, ritual, and religion, and reveled in on St. Patrick's Day. So heavily Irish was my context that it came as something of a shock when I began to consciously realize that not all white people are Irish. But importantly, never did I think the converse, that not all Irish are white. Despite the evidence of my own family, Irishness was synonymous with whiteness. The boundaries Irish people drew around being Irish marginalized people like me. In part, this was due to a broader and specifically American logic of racial categorization that bounds blackness and whiteness in relation to each other. The presence of one negating the other. One drop of black blood made one black and categorically defin definitionally not white. Coupled with this were particularly strong notions of what Irish looks like. My blue eyes might have helped to authenticate me as Irish. My Afro disqualified me. Blacks were few and far between in my town then. Yet in spite of this, or perhaps because of it, Blackness occupied outside space in the community's imagination, one that permeated the kid culture of the neighborhood. Choosing sides for a game of Ring Olivio, for example, we would each put our foot in a circle while one kid counted off 
nigga, nigga, pull the trigger, bang, bang, you're dead. This chant was used on those occasions when the counter A didn't know one of the McLeans was in the circle, B didn't know that we were black, or C didn't care. But don't worry about it, Kim. A well-meaning friend could be counted on to offer as she put her arm around my shoulder. You're only half black. Racial slights, slurs, and attempts to humiliate because we were black or half-breeds were a constant in my childhood. Or perhaps it's more accurate to say that they happened regularly enough that the feeling that I must be alert and prepared to combat them was, was the constant. The whiteness of Irishness was related to an explicit anti-blackness, animated in particularly ugly ways in the 70s. School desegregation, and the busing of black students into South Boston put violence and racist, racist sentiment of some Irish Americans on display and the nightly news. Those events and many others profoundly shaped my relationship to Irishness such that despite all that I had in common with my peers, ancestrally and culturally, I never quite, quite felt like part of the group. This origin story conforms in expected ways with how ancestry and ethnicity are understood in the US. I am Irish because I'm born of people, born of people, born of people from Ireland, participating in institutions and rituals that others so designated practice and with those others so designated. I am black Irish because I am also born of people, born of people from, as it were, Africa. But to tell the story in this familiar way obscures as much as it reveals. I might also narrate my Irishness this way. My great grandparents, John McLean and Martha McKay were born in South Carolina in the late 1840s. Their son, Wilton, whose death certificate you're looking at right now died at the age of around 45, when his son, my father, was three months old. This record is the only one I have of them, and so the story I can tell about their particular lives is limited. Nevertheless, their names and the fact that they were colored offer some possibilities for speculation. The names McLean and McKay indicate, perhaps, Scots-Irish connection, the, the designation referring to descendants earlier migrations of Protestants from Ireland adopted to distinguish themselves from the predominantly Catholic post-famine migration. I've always assumed that my surname was a slave name, indicative of who owned my ancestors, not my kin. In the same way that my great-grandmother Martha McKay seems likely to have come by hers. There's a McKay plantation right near where she was born. Those owners, of course, might also be ancestors in the way so many African-Americans come by their non-African ancestry. The source perhaps of my grandfather's funny looking eyes, green as a neighbor once described them to me, and my father's blue colored ones. Or like Michelle Obama, whose third great grandmother, Melvinia, gave birth to the children of her Irish owner. Something that Rachel Swarns, who will be speaking at this conference in two weeks, has documented in her research. That most African Americans have non-African ancestors is, is widely acknowledged and typically attributed to the institutionalization of rape as a form of control under slavery. But perhaps John McLean and Martha McKay derived their names from their Irish fathers, kin who cared for them and one imagines their black mothers, as is the case in Muhammad Ali's family. When asked about the Irish surname of his mother, Odessa Grady, Ali is said to have assumed it derived from the rape of an ancestor by an Irish master. As it turns out, Ali's great-grandfather Abe had married his great-grandmother, a freed slave. Reading the genealogical record against the grain of dominant understandings of ancestry and race describes a means through which the Irish became black. It disrupts the common sense that equates Irishness with whiteness and invites us to ask more complicated questions about the historical encounter between, between blacks and Irish in the US. 
David Shioni Moore illustrates the point when he writes of Roots, Roots author Alex Haley, quote, one would have been stunned to have found Haley's discursus beginning with the fully genealogical defense of the sense, sentence. Early in the spring of 1750 in the village of Bally Shannon on the upper end of Donegal Bay, a man child was born to Patty and Mary O'Reilly. And though it may sound strange to the air to describe people understood to be black as Irish, this is only testament to the effectiveness and durability of one drop ideology decades after many of the practice of Jim's, practices of Jim Crow segregation that had served to implement have been dismantled. It invites and makes a claim on Irishness that those to whom it is easily granted may find jarring. And yet to describe blacks as Irish is merely to restate a commonplace that most African-Americans have European ancestors as well. Unearthing the ancestral lineages of the unknown numbers of Blacks with Irish ancestors, the other Muhammad Ali's and Michelle Obama's, merely adds to the weight of the evidence. But it does more than that. These examples show that the, that the Irish became Black through the erasure of the genealogical ties between Blacks and Irish, creating in some sense a hidden Irish diaspora unaware of itself as such. Revealing that Black Irish diaspora broadens the conception of the Irish beyond the boundary of whiteness. And it also prompts us to reimagine the Irish America within the boundary of whiteness. While the Irish American Ur story depicts the trajectories of descendants of poor, rural, post-Catholic, post-famine Catholic immigrants, the example of Alex Haley's Irish ancestor reminds us of an earlier migration and Michelle Obama's of an Anglo-Irish one. They point to the different routes by which those claiming Irish roots come by them, whether black or white. It reminds us as well that as the work of Mary Waters, Mike Houghton, Josh Goldstein, and Reginald Byron have shown, those who identify themselves as Irish American are not a neatly bonded group of solely Irish individuals. Of the 40 plus million who claim Irish ancestry in the US, three quarters are simultaneously something else, the result of extensive intermarriage between Irish and other white ethnics. Nevertheless, those descendants are more likely to claim an Irish identity from the ethnic options available to them. For whites at least, Irish American identification is not only a chosen identity, it's a preferred one. Genealogies are never a simple cataloging of our ancestors or our ancestry. We can never know them all, and so they're unnecessarily partial. But they're partial not only because of the limits of record keeping uh, or memory, they're partial because they're social. Which ancestors we remember or forget, what forms of relatedness we recognize or deny are shaped by culture and politics. As patterns of white Irish identification and black racial categorization make clear, some ancestors count more than others. The Irish became black through a more general process through which American racial boundaries hardened in the late 19th and 20th century. In an atmosphere of hysteria over the specter of racial equality with the demise of slavery, other means of controlling black people and maintaining white dominance took its place, including the panoply of segregationist policies that, we, that would come to be known as Jim Crow. Laws forbidding interracial marriage and legitimizing the one drop rule passed in the post reconstruction period enabled racial segregation, the monopoly of resources for whites and reinforced a belief in the realness of race as the legitimate basis upon which to exclude and oppress and effectively suppressed the acknowledgement of interracial kinship. In this light, might unearthing our Black Irish past serve to undermine the logics of race that have been so destructive in American life? Stephanie Raines argues that the genealogical practice, though often criticized for being essentially nostalgic and conservative, might serve as a means to engage the genuinely far-reaching social, cultural, cultural and ideological changes of the present. 
Catherine Nash wonders if inclusive, the sense of inclusivity that many Irish people embrace will be extended to racial hybridity. But for all its possibility, unearthing a Black Irish past grounded in shared descent is susceptible to reproducing the worst aspects of US racial logics. The current popularity of recreational DNA testing is a case in point. Genetic genealogy, as Alondra Nelson dubs it, is wildly popular, particularly with African Americans, as it promises to fill in the gaps in the genealogical record wrought by slavery and the Middle Passage. People are turning to genetic science to discover or confirm ancestry in the hopes of attaining membership, belonging, and rights in community and reparations for historical harms. Nelson describes the use of genetic test kits as grassroots politics writ small, a forensic mechanism for getting at the truth. Like narrated memory of family stories and the genealogical records of formal bureaucratic institutions, DNA is used to bear witness to their place and descent-based groups. Far less so than family stories and even birth certificates, however, genetic markers have no obvious meaning or value in and of themselves. Never fear, the corporate marketers of genetic testing services will supply a meaning for you. In the, in the form of impossibly precise percentages of ancestry, derived from questionable biogenetic markers, whose exclusive Irishness or whatever is a fiction. In so doing, they reinforce the most pernicious dimensions of racial thinking. The idea that racial differences are biological, self-evidently meaningful and explain social differences. And they make those ideas harder to, to dislodge precisely because they've been given the imprimatur of scientific authority. The belief in dissent as the most legitimate means through which one acquires and serves, secures rights in a given place is widespread. The common ground of arguments from very different political ends of the spectrum and with seemingly different goals, for example, movements for reparations for the descendants of slaves, using blood quantum as a threshold for tribal membership um, secured by DNA testing, or white nationalists spinning white homeland fantasies. So efforts to elaborate a shared, shared descent as the basis of social solidarity or rights seems to me wrongheaded precisely because they are such powerful means to exclude people from full participation in the life of a community and just some recent examples in Ireland, changes to birthright citizenship in 2003, make it conceivable and possible that a child of an African immigrant in Ireland who's lived there all her life has less claim to rights than the grandchild of an Irish immigrant in America who's never been there. Or, um, or this example, Unamin Kavanaugh, a young woman in Ireland born in Vietnam adopted by an Irish family, an Irish speaker and a teacher of the language routinely has to defend her belonging in Ireland because as many would argue, she doesn't have an ancestral tie to language in which she has a, a wonderful response. I'll, I'll let you visit her page um, to hear more from her. The point, I find the idea of a black Irish diaspora, far more appealing as a mode of using our past to create a better future. A diaspora of diasporas of the black and green Atlantics, if you will. Black Irish can designate many different realities, whether in the US, Ireland, or elsewhere, even as they may be shaped by similar logics of race and citizenship, a kind of shared identity that accommodates differences and doesn't depend for its significance on naturalized modes of belonging. Projects like Black and Irish, or even this conference, draw on the histories and examples of Blacks, Irish, and Black Irish peoples globally, discursively connecting the experiences of the Black Irish to that of broader African and Irish diasporas, and, and in so doing, help to produce this Black Irish diasporic imaginary. 
one that disentangles, if not entirely disconnects, place, time, culture, and nation in ways that might allow us to think more flexibly about the specificities of our experiences and what they have in common. In a very real way, the specificities of the Black, Irish, and Ireland that I just started with have helped draw attention to the contours of the Black, Irish experience in America. At the same time, police killings of unarmed Black people in here have catalyzed Black, Irish, and Ireland. These are my children, nieces, and nephews. I often refer to them as McLean's 2.0, the next gen of our family. And in the positions my siblings and I, Mary and Jim's kids, as the first one. It illustrates the arbitrariness of the genealogical shaping of descent. Like all genealogies, it matters when you start the story and what you choose to tell. It's misleading in some sense, fitting in another, at least within the American context, in late 20th century Boston, it did feel like we were a new starting point. Born pre and post loving, the decision when interracial marriage fully became fully legal in the United States, in a place that had worked hard to stigmatize and erase, if not entirely forget its mixed origins. They are black and Irish all, and also collectively Jamaican, Danish, Dutch, and Native American, and others long forgotten, whose significance in ethnic terms is irrelevant in their lives. The meaning of their identity as Black Irish will necessarily be different for them than for me, just as it varies between me and my siblings, because our contexts are different. Some of them live in a very different Boston. You may have seen the mayor, the new mayor of Boston elected Tuesday, is a young Asian American woman from Chicago, Michelle Wu. Uh, they're not embedded in Irish dominant communities. They're less connected to Irish institutions and practices and their relation to black communities is different as well. Our genealogies can tell us something about who we are and we, where we come from but it's the stories we tell about their significance that determine their usefulness. And so I, I gave examples of my neighborhood life as a kid, but I wanted to offer another example that was even more powerfully influential. And that is down the street and through the woods, the experience our family had being involved in what was called Packard Mance a co-living ecumenical faith community, several of whose founders were former Catholic nuns and priests, many of Irish descent, including my lovely friend Chrissy's father, Patrick Hughes, the person whose presence at the manse has stayed with me most vividly. We didn't live there, but my parents worked alongside those who did and the many that passed through, an interracial group of Jews, Catholics, Protestants, and even some witches, organizing for fair housing legislation, the walk for hunger and against the Vietnam War. It's where I learned the Berrigan brothers and went to my first protests. I have vivid memories of my mother packing boxes for the weekly food cooperative pickup, communal dinners in the manse and yogurt before it was mass produced. People who came from many walks of life <clears throat> motivated whatever the story of their people to forge a kind of solidarity that didn't rely on shared blood. I see this in my parents' example as well. With the history of one's ancestors, their particular struggles become a means through which to recognize the struggles of others and to act with them to make all of our lives better. So let me end with one last Black Irish story. This 1910 census record highlighting the household of a Mr. Gaston McCollum, a likely Scotch-Irish railroad engineer and his wife and two children in North Carolina. You'll notice the 11-year-old mulatto white servant, one Emma Dunlap, living, with, living in their household. Emma was my grandmother. Though she can read and write, Emma does not go to school, 
And though my grandmother worked all her life as a domestic and then a hotel cook, she remained poor all her life. This reading of the genealogical record gets to the heart of what Noel Ignatiev in How the Irish Became White was trying to explain. The function of racialization, turning the Irish into whites and Africans into blacks, worked to obscure their shared class interests and to misrecognize the class character of the racialized oppression and exploitation my grandmother and so many others did and do experience, effectively limiting the kind of interracial solidarity and mobilization needed to solve our biggest problems. If our genealogies are to be really useful, they will orient us to that past so that we may recognize its analogs in the present. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. I'm just checking that I'm not muted here. I don't think I am. That's great. Wonderful. What a, what a fabulous presentation. And, and I'm so glad it's been recorded because that means we can not only pour over it, but we can get it in front of our students and share it because I think we should. Um, I, I was really struck in, in, in part just by the, the use of your images, that's a very, very powerful thing to do when you're talking about memory and about identity. But before we go on to anything else, could you comment a little on that? Images are family images. They're, they're, they're public, but they're also private. You know, you're sharing a great deal here. I wonder if you'd care to comment on that. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I got permission for most of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I thought about that a lot. Um, mm especially in the age of nothing, everything lives forever on the internet. Um, but you know, I suppose I think images are powerful. Mm. And, um, and we often, I mean, putting them in relationship to each other, seeing sort of the generational shift, seeing the people who actually took the risks before it was even legal to cross deeply entrenched boundaries and in, in places and times where it, it could get you hurt if not killed um, matters. Um, but you'll also know there are, see that there are no images of my black ancestors except my father. Right. And it speaks to a lot of the, the ways in which racialization matters for limiting the possibilities for people depending yep. on how they're designated. You know, my Irish ancestors were poor, but they were able um, to get an education. Some could read and write when they came here, but some couldn't. Uh, they were, my great grandparents were bricklayers. Um, my grandmother had a high school education. So they were, you know, able and did well over the generations. Um, my grandparent, my grandfather died in his 40s from a heart attack. He was a street sweeper, right? Yeah. There are no photos of that. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, my enslaved ancestors is hardly any records, let alone mm -hmm. photos. That, that's that's wonderful. It's fascinating because, of course, the, these these are very different forms of documentation, but they, they both reveal and conceal histories. And there's a real excavation going on here, which is remarkable, I think. Um, taking you back to Boston again, if we could, a city that's much changed, as you've observed. And let me just pause because I should at the outset have asked and invited people to to put, place questions in, in the chat box. I hope you will. So, so far, it's just lots of praise, uh, but hopefully there'll be chat coming as well. So do please put questions in there. Um, Boston, fascinating city to, to, to think about in, in so many different ways, um, but I, I was struck by that experience that you had, and you, you contextualize it a little bit about talking about the, 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 the choices that you know, people have perhaps in more recent times in Boston and elsewhere to be Irish, and particularly perhaps white Irish Americans have that choice. I've come across that as well in talking to Irish Americans about uh, why it's a choice and how they perceive it as choice, but I think that word choice is so loaded in so many ways. Um, can everyone make that choice? Or to put it another way, when you talk to people who have, 
why, if there's all of these other ethnic opportunities available to them, why Irish? Well, you know, Mary Waters' work on this and, and Catherine Nash and Diane Negra's work, I mean, they all describe in different ways what I think is still operative in the United States, these positive associations with Irishness, gregariousness, tell a good joke, um, life of the party. These are things that sort of like culturally valued, but also the perception that the Irish are not quite white, actually. Mm -hmm. It's a whiteness that is imaginatively connected to a past of hardship and exclusion. And so it's the whiteness you can feel good about. Right. You know, um, it's, it's not the British, right? It's not, or the English. Mm -hmm. It's hard scrabble, it's tough. I mean, there's, in popular culture that gets reinforced all the time. Yeah. Goodwill hunting, um, the town, you know, lots of movies set in a working class Boston Irish context in which loyalty matters, um, toughness matters, the sense that you have, you know, come up in the world and suffered and but made it. Right? Mm. All of these things are values that I think resonate with many Americans, particularly the, the narrative of struggle and triumph. Mm -hmm while also be, not being um, a homogeneously white. Not homogeneously white, I, th I think so. Um, I, I interviewed a, a number of young Americans who claim Irish heritage over the last year on a project, and I, I placed that question to them, why do you choose to be Irish? Which can be quite a disquieting question, if put too bluntly, but I put it as kindly and you know, properly as I could. And, and one simply said, well, um, it means I'm not just white. And, and I think that goes a little bit to what you're saying there. There's something, it, it, it affords a difference, but it's nonetheless a choice. And, and having such a choice, doesn't it betoken a certain form of privilege as well? Absolutely. I mean, this is the sort of, um, much what much of, particularly my social scientists who, that they document the, to the extent that Irishness can be chosen, it sort of shines a light of the extent to which it isn't blackness, right? Yeah. It, I mean, fundamentally that's inscribed in law, it's inscribed in social custom and it was enforced through violence for over a century. So the choice, um, the choice in and of itself tells you everything you know about, need to know about the relevant distinctions between the groups. And I think the question now is where the openings are for that sense of hybrid Irishness to include people who aren't white or don't identify as white, uh, but have Irish, either Irish ancestors or live in Ireland. Well, I, I'm dying to come back to you and, and, and say more, but there's so many questions coming in. I'm going to do my proper job, which is read them out. Um, the first one here is from Jennifer Lusser, um, uh, which is, thanks for the fantastic talk. I grew up in the 70s with an Irish-American mom and an African-American dad. We lived in a predominantly Irish Catholic neighborhood in San Francisco. I'm curious about your experience with the church. Did you feel welcome? When I was born, the local parish refused to baptize me. The priest told my mother to try at the cathedral downtown. They might do it. She refused to forum shop. Uh, that my parents were married in Protestant church was the explanation, but I've always suspected there's more to it. I'm today a practicing Catholic and would love to have a conversation with that priest from 1966. But I suppose what that comes back to at the heart of it is the question to you is what your, your experience with the church, where, where does religion figure into this complex excavation? Oh, that's such a great question. It's funny, and, and when Christine um, was talking earlier, I wrote a note to myself, I need to write a paper on the Catholic Church, the clergy who actually made decisions about interracial marriage before it was legal. Because, you know, the church is this interesting place on the one hand, and maybe I'll, you, you know, I mean, I guess I'm gonna say this, mom, I, I hope it's okay. Um, you know, my mother's uncle wouldn't marry my parents, um, although he was a priest, um, for complicated reasons I'm sure I don't know all about. 
Um, but in terms of my own experience in the church, I didn't, I, I didn't feel that. It wasn't, um, I didn't feel that we were excluded from the life of the church at all. And I suppose, you know, the story I told at the end about, the, about packet nuns, these were former nuns and priests um, who are, to me, some of the people I most respect in the world. Um, because of what they did in the face of the kind of pressure, um, it would have been perfectly okay if they never extended themselves, right? But they did on behalf of not just their own. So I, you know, I see as, you know, Christine was saying, the church evolves. It's not a static institution. And so, um, yeah, but there's a, there's a lot there. I think there's a lot not said yet or not excavated yet, even about the recent past and the recent changes in the church. And I, I would also say to that, um, all of the stuff about race is also complicated with the sexual abuse scandal. I mean, I did stop going to church in 2002 because of that. And that scandal broke in Boston. Um, and that was just, just a bridge too far. Um, but yeah, go on. There's more questions here and, and just picking up a few of these. One, one says, um, and I, if I understand this one, it says, do you ever feel vested in either culture or both? And, and I think that, that that's asking in part, where, where, is it a balance? Is it a tension? I mean, black and Irish, the, the conjunction can do a lot of work at times there. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, it, you know, I, I, I think of myself as a black mixed race woman who is Irish. Uh, and, and what that means is, and, and the Irishness has largely been about family as opposed to um, a social network, right? I've said this before, I, I feel least Irish on St. Patrick's Day because there's a way of this overwhelming um, uh, it seems like it's welcoming and open, but it feels actually very exclusionary um, in a way that I just dislike. Um, so I think, um, I don't know that it's a tension anymore, maybe when I was little, mm. you know, when I was learning what it meant to be what I was. Okay, well, this next question is going to take you back to being little again. Um, could you comment, this is from William Long, could you comment on any gender differences and how your siblings experienced their identities growing up in South Boston? And did you attend parochial or public schools and what was the experience like for you? Okay, yeah, I want to say south of Boston, not the south Boston that everyone has in their mind. Um, the gender differences, one, I didn't, we didn't go to parochial schools. My parents went to Catholic schools, um, but we did not. Um, the gender differences are real, for sure. Mm -hmm. And they have to do with the familiar things. The, and Christine was just talking about this as well, the emphasis put on physical appearance for women. And when you sort of go outside feminine ideals of beauty, which are highly racialized, that shapes your experience your hair in particular. So in the 70s, wearing my hair in an Afro, which was, you know, fashionable, um, but it was also decidedly not white. It creates a kind of uh, boundary. For my brothers, um, you know, we all look, we look very similar, but our hair is different. And you know, for my older brother, nobody knows he's black unless he's in context of his family. Um, and my younger brother's usually thought of as any, anything you want to place on him, um, he, he can fit anywhere. Um, and so for them, there's a certain, that they were both athletes too, so that helped. 
um, they're fit, fitting in on some level, but it's also being a black man in a white context, you have to sort of watch how, what boundaries you stay within. Yeah. You know? I hope I'm answering that. No, 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 that, 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 that really does take us back into that experience, I think. Um, I'm just uh, going through the questions. There's, there's a lot of comments and questions here. Um, one of these is uh, taking us outwards in a way to Ireland. I'm just coming back to that because uh, it was one of the earlier ones and I wanted not to lose it. Let me just uh, uh, get it here. Yeah, this one's from uh, Rebecca king Uh Great paper, Kim. In contemporary Ireland, there is some discussion that white Irish people are not as racist because they are post-colonial people and racialized in the past themselves. But young Asian and black Irish people, my students, are now fairly successfully calling that out. Black Lives Matter was a big protest in Dublin. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, this is a great question from wonderful sociologist Becky King O'Rean, who writes, has written on how, how the Irish became more than white um, and kind of talking and explaining the experiences of in particular mixed race, race Irish in contemporary Ireland. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is in some ways the gets at, it's a contemporary expression of what Kevin was talking about earlier, kind of calling out the idea of the Irish aren't white and that that becomes, or this history of having been non, considered non-white or not quite white, in some ways is, give, is understood as giving them a kind of equivalence with the struggles of people who are racialized, um, particularly as black people now, whether it be in the United States or Ireland. Um, yeah, I think it's, um, it's a, in some ways it's a kind of politics on the ground that's, that is also mimicked in the academic literature, I would say, the debates over the validity of the comparison. Okay. Does it does that come back to this choice component again? And 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 you, I thought you were very carefully telling us there are are risks as well as opportunities in this unearthing that uh, is is proceeding. Um, if that romanticization of blackness is present within um, Irish consciousness of what it means to be Irish, doesn't that need to be explored as well? Yeah, for sure. Um... And I, you know, I think um, Lauren Anke's book, mm -hmm. um, Blackness and Transatlantic, um, I always mess up the, the title, but the subtitle is Celtic Soul Brothers. It's such a sharp, astute reading of the ways that artists, writers, musicians um, have used the comparison of the Irish to black people in particular, African-Americans, to kind of re-narrate what Irishness is and means. It's so, I, I think she does an amazing job because she's, she's not blanketly dismissing the comparison, but she's looking at the ways that there is an alighting of difference where it actually matters for explaining how, say, uh, Catholic struggles in Northern Ireland are, are different in, in important ways than what was going on in the civil rights movement. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that has to be continually, we have to be careful about that, but also to me, the, the, the goal needs to be, well, what do we learn from understanding that struggle that we can use for thinking about the forms of exclusion that we actually do experience? We don't, they don't have to be the same. They don't have to be um, romanticized. We can just look at them for what they are. Exploitation in various ways needs to be called out on its own terms. And it doesn't really matter so who, who is being exploited? It's that they're being exploited. Right. 
When you think about Ireland and the US here in terms of Irishness, I mean, clearly there are commonalities, but there's a lot of difference at work. I, I just wonder if that's one of those areas. In other words, that romanticization of blackness that one sees in Ireland, I'm not sure it is marked in the same way in American culture when people think of Irishness. Um, I mean, clearly Americans today do look back at the history of their Irishness in very complex and different ways. I mean, you can have a very conservative reading of American history that fits your identity of being Irish today, or you can have a very radical one. Uh, it can go in different directions. Right. I suppose that's a long-winded way of saying that when I look at Irish America from the outside, which I mostly do, I see a very conservative group of people. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I... I want to speak carefully because I don't study that particular question in depth. My experience, however, is would would suggest that you're right. Um, however, uh, there are, there's always a counter narrative, a counter formation, um, where I would say I, some Irish Americans are among the most radical amongst us. Um, but Irish, the, the potential romanticization, or, or even, not even that word, the sort of interest in and respect for Black Americans that Irish people have is, is not mirrored in the United States. At the same time, um, I think the romanticization of the Irish by many Irish Americans is also something that I can see, I feel like exists among African Americans in this way. And I think, I think it's the whiteness that black people also can tolerate in this way. As, as we do our DNA test kits, as we find that you know, minuscule percentage of ancestry that the corporation told us is from Ireland. It's the one that you might be willing to explore as a black person, right? Yeah. Where you could maybe even have some imaginative identification with for all the same reasons that many Irish Americans find that a kind of hero story of um, oppression, toughness, gregarious, all of these qualities that Americans like about the Irish. Yeah, fascinating. I'm gonna turn back to the questions because there, there's still lots of them coming and comments. The next one's from Amy Elizabeth Robinson. Um, I had a white grandfather, a descendant of famine migrants who identified as Irish and who worked in an industrial historically disadvantaged black area of Philadelphia in the 1960s. He was a member of the NAACP and anecdotally was vocal in support of civil rights. I've been wondering whether his experience was anomalous in that place and time of white flight. What's your understanding of the extent of Black Irish solidarity during the civil rights era? Yeah, that's a good, um, good question. Um, and I'm sure there are people who know this better than I. Um, and again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of draw on context. Um, I think there's a way that, I mean, demographically, and in terms of the behavior of Irish Americans in response to advancements in civil rights, protections, and op the opening of institutions to Black people, whether it be white flight, um, whether it be kind of a reaction to integration, I, I mentioned busing in Boston. Um, all of these indicate a certain, a, a real conservativeness. Um, and we, and the, so the Reagan Democrats, many of whom were Irish who left the Democratic Party, right? But then I think of people like my mother, right? Who, she's not a radical. She's just someone who <laughs> sees this is wrong. And I need to do what I can to not to not continue it, right? Mm. Um, 
or again, um, Patrick Hughes, who I mentioned, or Jim Carroll, who will be speaking in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. I, I don't know that I have a who does have a definitive answer on that. We have broad trends that suggest a general conservativeness when it came to questions yeah. of moving a, a greater equality between Blacks and Irish and whites in general, yeah. um, but certainly counter examples as well. Absolutely, it's very powerful. So I was thinking of Tom Hayden as you were speaking, yeah. um, who very much claims his Irishness as a, a reaction in some ways to what his experience of the civil rights movement was. Exactly. Um, another one here, Kim, which is off the same area we're talking about. Uh, let me just check, I've got the name of the person. William Nevins. Kim, thanks for a fine presentation. Do you have any experience of or comments on the work in South Boston, Massachusetts, more generally of the Freedom Road organizing project, which brought together leftist speakers from Ireland, including Bernadette Devlin, Michael Farrell, Fergus Hare, and others with black and other POC activists, and sent Bill Fletcher Jr. to Northern Ireland in 1988. Fletcher then spoke in South Boston and Roxbury on his observations on the Irish war then going on and published in several magazines. I know this is history, but were you aware of it? I only recently became aware of it, um, quite honestly, um, in sort of doing the, the reading around this. And um, I'm excited to read more. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it, when I read what Bernadette Devlin had to say about her being here and, and, and just being able to identify very quickly, like th the racism that was so reminiscent of her experience in Northern Ireland and being able to call it out as such. Um, one, it's inspiring to me. And two, it also reminds me of, you know, the, uh, the response not all Irish Americans have when they go to Ireland, but certainly the one I remember my mother telling me about when she went to Ireland, like, and I, I hope she's not, I hope I'm getting this, remembering this right, mom. Um, I re remember her saying to me, I felt proud to be Irish when I went to Ireland because of, I imagine the way my father was received because they had a great time, they love it there. Um, but this sense that the sort of parochialness, the, the racism, among Irish Americans, she didn't feel there. Yeah. To me, that, that history is inspiring. Thank you, William. I'm, I'm going to keep moving on here, but I've noticed a few people have said, are there any of these references we can get at another point? And Miriam has quickly and very helpfully said that a list of references will be created. So everyone will hopefully be able to catch up on that. Uh, a question or a comment from Sarah Townsend. Uh, thank you for this terrific presentation. I'm fascinated not only about what these genealogies reveal about the fantasy of Irish whiteness, but also about what effect they might have on citizenship rights and policy going forward. For instance, the common assumption, as I understand it, is that bloodline citizenship was preserved when birthright citizenship was revoked in 2004 because it was presumed that those with Irish ancestors will be white. I'm not sure about that evidence, it may be flawed. However, have you given any thought to how these Black Irish histories might affect or inform legal policies, immigration laws, or other social phenomena in Ireland or elsewhere? Well, yeah, I mean, that's what I was getting at at the end. There's this kind of crazy, um, or dual way in which birthright as the legitimate basis through which rights are secured, is both, it's, it's kind of a common sense way in which even those who would be quite aware of the problematic dimension of that basis for citizenship, it, to the extent that it does exclude people and makes people who become citizens by naturalization somewhat um, still not quite legitimately or fully um, embraced as citizens of the place in which they're naturalized. The idea that, well, of course you have citizen because you're born in a place and that that's totally right and good. Um, it, it's also kind of strange when you step back from it, right? Like why, right, why? Um, so I think that, 
you know, the fact that, um, you know, I know people with Irish passports who have never been there, mm -hmm. but because their grandparent was a citizen mm -hmm. and their child got citizenship because of that, they're able to be citizens, mm -hmm. right? Um, now that's true if they're white or black, it's not, it's not built into Irish um, law, but it has, with the change in birthright citizenship there, created this weird possibility that a child of an immigrant who's not granted citizenship um, might not necessarily have access to the same suite of rights that someone who's never been there has. It's also, to me, the probably more um, commonplace reason where it's the way in which it shows up as problematic is when I showed that clip of Unaman Kavanaugh um, being challenged, which she is on a regular basis in the, the troll universe that is Twitter, um, that she doesn't belong in Ireland. Um, it's often Irish Americans who challenge her. And they challenge her on the basis of where, where I come from, you would never be considered Irish. Mm. And I'm like, exactly. But that's exactly the absurdity of it all. Mm. Um, but that's how it functions, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've got a question that takes us into, I suppose, the, 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 the populist politics of the present, and maybe they're not avoidable. So let's have that one from Jim uh, Dingman. Currently, we are in the midst of populist movements in the United States that dig up the bloodlines to demonstrate who and who is not an American. What do you think of the use of these comments uh, by the right as it regards mythologizing Scots-Irish roots as a form of racial separateness? Steve Bannon loves to talk about this. What do you think? I think it's, well, I obviously, I think it's insane. I think it's pernicious, but I also think it makes sense precisely because of our history, which, you know, the American logic of race, despite the fact that um, it's changed and opened up but in, in the last 20 years, now people can check multiple boxes on the census. They have been able to choose their own racial identification since 1960. Um, it's still predicated on a logic of dissent and but dissent in which some forms of dissent are recognized for some purposes and not others. It's why in the United States, you can have without a contradiction, a black person who looks white. It's because of this one drop ideology that becomes entrenched by the twenties and World War I and eventually becomes socially accepted by the very people it's meant to exclude and oppress. So African Americans, we're used to it seeing ourselves in many colors, right? And that's a, a legacy of that boundary being put up um, that in some ways facilitated our exclusion in the form of separate um, facilities, et cetera, segregation. Um, but ideologically, it's shaped who we, who we are. Um, so that logic of dissent is very much entrenched. And so on some level, the white nationalist says, well, yes, dissent, blood, that's what matters. That's what defines us. And we're going to bound it this way. We've seen this before. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, question from... Um... Uh, Kevin Kenny, one of the speakers earlier today, and, and, and Kevin brings us back to this question of choice and says, what if someone didn't want any of the items on today's menu of identities? Is it possible to opt out as well as opt in? I don't, you know, um, in formal terms, sure. Mm -hmm. On the ground, you tell me. Um, you know, on the, the, the thing about the privileges or disadvantages of your racial subjection is that even though we might choose it at the level of identification, mm -hmm. other people make choices for us. So it's actually somewhat hard to dislodge your own advantage 
as a white person by refusing. Um, and it's also hard to avoid the negative consequences of being racialized by others simply because you don't choose it as an identity. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, um, you know, not to call out any of my kids, I think that for the McLean's 2.0 that I was pointing to, you know, they have a consciousness and awareness of what who their ancestors are. Mm -hmm. It's going to be hard for some of them to claim. They can say, I'm Black. Um, it's going to be hard for, that, for other people to authenticate them as that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And or in, diff in different ways. Does it matter? Um, I think this is the bigger question, right? Um, and I think we need to be clear about this. At least for, for my kids, they're Black Americans, Jamaican, Irish, all of these things. But they're also of upper middle class parents. Um, so, you know, there are some things, you know, we often talk about the prison industrial complex and um, hyper incarceration of black people, but it's principally an institution that incarcerates poor people, right? So my black sons, while I might rhetorically say they have more, you know, their likelihood of being imprisoned is much higher than a white person's, the likelihood of them being imprisoned is much lower because they come from a family with resources. So to me, you know, these issues of choice, who can choose what and for what purpose matter, yes, but so too does class to get back to it. Yes, class and, and, and I think just in line with that, this is more an observation than a question, but one could also bring up sexuality here. And one of the questions has uh, is from a Marie Honan and, and really addressed to everyone saying, as an aside on massive contradictions within Irish America, in the 1990s, some Irish Americans in New York like to tell us Irish LGBTQ people to go back where we came from. Their legal arguments against their inclusion in the St. Patrick's Day period uh, were frequently based on the notion that we weren't Irish. And, and I'm sure many of us remember uh, that recent history, actually. Um, any, any thoughts on that uh, particular narrative um, or, or more broadly on the issues of sexuality, uh, which also cross cut these matters of identity in complex ways? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's an interesting um, way in which uh, certain forms of marginal marginalization get talked about. So I, in Jamaica too, this is, you know, someone who, you know, someone who's acting outside dominant norms is foreign, mm -hmm. right? And so the casting out of the nation on the basis of whatever it is, sexuality, um, religious difference, racial difference. It's a kind of, it's a, it's a technique um, of framing belonging and, and rights and um, in, in a polity, right? And the language we use to talk about that signifies the, the underlying bases by which normative citizenship is granted. So I, I, I find that language very, very telling, right? Yeah. Well, we've had so many comments here um, that are thanking you for this amazing talk. Uh, just one of them is staring me at the screen. Thanks for the thoughtful and stimulating discussion today for everybody. Thanks for sharing and presenting. This was dynamite. Um, I can't say anything more than that in conclusion. It was dynamite. Uh, what you're doing, I think, is unearthing not just a genealogy, but an incredibly rich and complex cultural history. And you and Miriam are doing a lot of the heavy lifting and a lot of us are gonna be grateful to you for a long time to come. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Liam. Liam, thank you so much. Uh, and Kim, um, I'm so glad that Liam was moderating it because you had me in tears by the end of it. You know, um, that was that dynamite is a great word, whoever used that. Um, thank you um, for everyone for coming back on and 
what a stimulating end to our first day. Amazing. Um, we're recording everything. We're hoping to make it to, to publish it uh, uh, as soon as we can. Um, please come back uh, next Friday. Um, it's going to be hard to live up to what uh, that, that was really something. Um, but we are reconvening um, next uh, Friday morning at 9 a.m., the nine o'clock start next Friday. Nikhil Singh from NYU will be um, talking about Ireland in the crucible of race. Fine scholar. He, uh, it'll be moderated by Kathleen Call, who is at NYU at the moment by way of the University of San Francisco. Kathleen may be on the line here. Um, Following following on from that, Alyssa Joy White, who I saw Alyssa was on earlier from UC Davis. Her paper is Caid Me La Falcha, When Blackness in Ireland Seemed New Again. That will be moderated by Brian Fanning from UCD, uh, one of Liam's colleagues. And following on from that, Shante Mouton Kinyon from Notre Dame University. The Ties That Bind, Resilience, Rebellion and Redemption in Uptight. It's a 1968 film. It will be moderated by our own Anna McCarthy, Chair of Cinema Studies here at NYU. We've two great panels in the afternoon. The Tenement News Museum in New York are going to talk to us about the wonderful uh, new programming on the intersections of African-American and Irish-American history in the Tenement Museum format. And that will be moderated, as I mentioned earlier, by the director of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, Dr. Joy Bivens. And the last panel of that day, um, Kim invoked her name a few times, Lauren Onke, who is now the uh, at George Washington University. She'll be in conversation with our own Mick Maloney, our own Lenwood Sloan, and that um, session will be moderated by Bill Ferris, um, renowned, uh, eminent uh, folklorist uh, from the University of North Carolina. That will be introduced by our own John Waters. Um, so another packed session next uh, Friday. Um, we'll, uh, as I said, it's a lot to live up to, um, uh, to continue. Uh, I, I, I bet, Kim, you're you're wiped after that, but you did a phenomenal job. And it's Thank so you. wonderful to, <laughs> to see us at this point with these uh, year long conversations in that vein. Um, I don't think there's anything else I need to say, is there? I don't think so. Thanks for being here, everyone. It's been a really special kickoff to, to this for us all. And Thank be so safe. Much for questions. This is great. Yeah, they were wonderful, wonderful. And we've captured them. Thanks, everyone. Have a good weekend. We'll see you next Friday. Thank you, Liam. Take care. Thanks, Liam.